and his disciples came to him to, for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these, all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be torn down. When it says in verse 1 that he wanted to show him the temple, that's when you want to show something off. You're proud about it. You want to really show how wonderful of a building this is. And as, as they desired to do that, Christ's testimony to them is that that temple is going to be torn down, that, that the glory of it is gone. He has just in the previous chapter departed out of the temple. They're going to have a worship of God that involves a temple, but without the truth of Jesus Christ, and it's going to be torn down. Nothing stands without a foundation, and Jesus Christ is that foundation. But as he, he asked that, he says in verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? Well, he's already there. He must be talking about the second coming. And the end of the world. And so, in Matthew chapter 24 is a prophetical chapter where Jesus Christ begins to answer those questions. Now, we're not going to study Matthew chapter 24, but he does refer to Daniel. In verse 15 it says, And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let him which be in Jerusalem flee unto the mountains. Let him which is in the house not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time nor ever shall be. There is no doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the end time and the things that are going to precede His second coming. Something that was future to the day of Jesus Christ's first coming, it was still future, that was coming, He says, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Then you know you're going to be entering into great tribulation and it's going to be the end time. Now, you know that He's talking about something future that's going to precede His second coming. If you go back with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 10, we're studying the book of Daniel, and we're in, excuse me, Daniel chapter 8. And in the 8th chapter of the book of Daniel, we begin to learn about the abomination of desolation. It'll tell us the timing of that abomination in Daniel chapter 9. But Daniel chapter 8 begins to talk about the abomination. We've learned last time in our study about the, the uh, identity of the little horn which we know and we commonly call in, in modern day circles the Antichrist. Uh, the Bible calls him in the book of Revelation the beast. And we're talking about at the end time when Satan's deception is going to be unleashed into this world and he's going to convince the world to call and worship him God, as God. That he is that little horn. And the Bible gives us indications of how to identify him and we realize that when the Grecian Empire was dissolved, it broke down into four empires, and from the northwestern section, primarily the northern section, of the old Grecian Empire is going to come a little horn. There would be four world empires until the final Antichrist Empire, and that is Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, then Rome, and that's when Jesus Christ came the first time, and then there'll be a revived Roman Empire in the future. That'll be made up of ten different nations, and a little horn is going to arise, according to chapter 7 of Daniel, and he's going to destroy three of those ten nations and take the power. And there'll be then seven heads over ten nations, and that'll be the last world empire that'll rule on this earth until Jesus Christ comes back and destroys that and sets up his kingdom on this earth, which shall never end. Now, those are the truths that we've learned so far. And in Daniel chapter 8, it gave us information how to identify, at least geographically, the location of where this little horn, the Antichrist, the beast, is going to come from, who is going to take the headship, the final dictatorship of the last world empire. And uh, we said to watch for Turkey. And uh, if you want to know why we said that, you get the tape of last uh, time's message and, and, and listen to those studies. But in verse 9 of Daniel chapter 8, we pick up with a little bit more information. It says, And out of one of them, speaking of the four divisions of the Grecian empire, 
out of that horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land, and it waxed great even unto the host of heaven, and it cast some of the host and, uh, and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them, and he magnified himself even unto the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and the host was given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. You notice that there is a, there's a daily sacrifice going on, but the, the daily sacrifice, was there was a host, an army given unto this little horn, to end the daily sacrifice, to seize the temple, to end the daily sacrifice. And it was given to him, it says in verse 12, by reason of transgression. And it cast the truth down to the ground and practiced and prospered. And then it says in verse 13, And I heard one of the saints speaking to another saint and said to that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily uh, sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. In verse 12, it talked about by reason of the transgression. Because of the transgression that was going on, this little horn, this Antichrist, was given political power and and an army to seize and stop, to take control of the temple in Jerusalem and end the sacrifices. And then it says there in verse 13 that that, uh, they're asking how long is going to be concerning the sacrifice, uh, uh, the daily sacrifice, and the transgression of desolation. He's going to make the sacrifice and the temple desolate. He's going to end it. And, And so you realize there's a desolation that takes place there. Now, Jesus Christ says, when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, what he's talking about is something that's going to happen concerning the sacrifice and the worship service of of the Jews in the tribulation time that was future to his first coming. Isn't that what he said? When ye shall see it? I say that because last time when we talked, we said that there is many who believe that when you read about the abomination that makes desolate and the transgression, that they say this was fulfilled in history. Back in the past that Antiochus Epiphanes came uh, from Syria and, and he was a Roman ruler and he fits all the description that's given here and that he went in and he did desecrate the temple in Jerusalem and ended the sacrifices and, uh, and erected a Greek god in the temple and ordered all to worship him. And that would be an abomination that did make that was desolate that was set up by Antiochus Epiphanes in the past. And so some people come to the book of Daniel chapter 8 and they say this is something that's already taken place. But I wanted you to see that when Jesus Christ was here on earth years after Antiochus Epiphanes, he said that it hasn't taken place yet, did he? Under the first, when Rome was ruling, he said to the people, when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. It was future to Christ's first coming and it's just prior to a second coming because he'll follow that time period and come back and reign. So I want you to realize what we're studying in Daniel chapter 8 is future. Even future yet to our day, it has not happened yet. We talked last time as well concerning, it talks about a transgression, by reason of the transgression. And we made note to you to stop to realize that the transgression is the very fact that Israel is sacrificing in the temple at all. The reason we say that is when you come to the book of Hebrews, it's very clear that the book of Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the all-sufficient final sacrifice for all sin. And if Jesus Christ himself gave his life on the cross to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and his death on the cross is all-sufficient, that it is the full, complete payment of sin, then for someone to take a lamb again and offer it on a sacrifice to God, they can do it just like the Old Testament says to do it. They can rearrange the priesthood, rebuild the the temple, and make this sacrifice, but it's denying God's sacrifice for sin, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 13, it tells the nation of Israel to to go to Jesus Christ outside the camp, approach Jesus Christ outside the the non-believing religious system of Israel and go, and go to Jesus Christ where and, and meet him outside the camp because outside the camp is where Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. 
And for Israel to be sacrificed is a denial of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for the payment of their sins. It's in unbelief that this is going on. And by reason of that transgression, this man, this Antichrist, is going to be able to deceive the world because they're all looking to, oh, wow, Israel rebuilt the temple and Israel's got the sacrifices going. Uh, By the way, do you realize that here's prophetical truth that says that before Jesus Christ comes back, Israel is not only going to be in their land, but they're going to have a temple and they're going to be offering sacrifices because that's the transgression that's going to cause the Antichrist to come and make that sacrifice desolate and set something else up in its place. But at least you know from prophetical references here that three things are going to take place before Jesus Christ comes back. Now, you know, in 1948, Israel became a nation again. 1967, they regained the area of Palestine, and they now have some political control over the area where the temple can be rebuilt. And there are plans, many have shared, that Israel in their, in their system is planning to rebuild that temple, already writing out the plans, restudying the Old Testament on how the sacrifices ought to be done and everything. And, and here's scriptural reference that tells you before Jesus Christ comes back in the second coming, that these things are going to be not just talked about, they're going to be happening, which tells you that we could be very close to the end times. Now, nothing is being fulfilled today in prophecy, but the stage seems to be being set for a future time in which all these things can just happen almost overnight. And so it's very interesting as we study this. Another thing I want you to realize is this is transgression. You know, I don't know, and, I, and perhaps you can help by saving me some literature that you get from other ministries, but I'm almost sure that I've heard Christian radio, on the Christian radio, people saying, not only pray for the, for the, the Jewish people, but I think I've heard that men ask that Christians send their money in to help Israel rebuild the temple. And, and, uh, and what a glorious thing this would be if Israel again rebuilds the temple and, and starts sacrificing again. Now, whether I've actually heard that or not, I I think I have, but I'd like to document it. And so if you ever see anything like that, you share it with me. But I want you to realize that's an abomination to God because it's a rejection of Jesus Christ. The very thing that Stephen indicted the nation of Israel for in Acts chapter 7, when they rejected Jesus Christ for that last and final time, he says that that God is not worshipped in temples made with man's hands. In other words, you worship God through Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus Christ taught. He says to the woman at the well, neither in in this place do you worship, neither in Jerusalem shall you worship, but they that worship God will worship him in spirit and in truth. And Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And Israel rejected that, and they stayed with their temple and their ritualism and their sacrifices. And, you know, the Gentile church today seems to be caught up in that. There's something else I want you to see. When this transgression it's by reason of this transgression that gives the the place for this deception to take place and then the transgression is what's going to make the des- make for the desolation according to verse 13 look over in verse 23 it says but in the latter time of their kingdom this is that antichrist kingdom and now it's the latter time of that kingdom it's just before jesus christ returns In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to a full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall shall stand up. And you, when you start talking about darkness, you're talking about the prince of darkness, you're talking about Satan coming in to work his deceptive means. In the last days, in the last Gentile world kingdom, Satan is going to come and infiltrate and become part of that kingdom. In fact, he'll be worshipped as God, as you're going to see in a, a few moments. But notice, we've talked about the transgression, that, that by reason of the transgression, uh, he cast the truth to the ground, that the transgression makes desolate. But in verse 23, it says, in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors... Now, that's a noun, isn't it? That means the sinners, the transgressors. You know, that's what sin is. Sin is transgressing, or sometimes we say trespassing the commandments of God, stepping over the boundaries. God says, don't you step over and do. That's trespassing. That's transgressing. And, and at, there's going to be at the end, the transgressors are going to come to a full. You know, the, the man Tino talked about is a man that thinks that God has to put up with him no matter what he wants to spew out of his mouth. 
concerning the man who was rejecting God and, and God says a fable and, and laughing in his face as he witnessed about Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we think that God will wait forever and will put up with mankind forever. But you know, this verse indicates he won't. There is going to be a time when transgressors are going to come to a full. When something is filled up, it means you can't put any more in it, doesn't it? It means you've come to the end of the line and now it's time for God to do something. And God's letting time go on, but there is going to be a time, God knows, and God's provision for sins is total. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. No matter what you've done, Jesus Christ has been the payment of your sin. But there's coming a time in the history of man when God's going to look down and say, transgressors are full, I've had enough. They've sinned all I'm going to allow them to sin. I'm going to put an end to things. And Jesus Christ is going to come back in judgment. And you know, not only we see that in the future, that's interesting to me because that's happened in the past. Come over with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 15. And here's something that you need to know about your Bible. The Bible says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Genesis chapter 15. There came a time after the Tower of Babel when men decided they didn't want anything to do with God. They turned from God. God raised up Abraham and said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. He cut off the Gentiles in their sins. And after the, 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 after 400 years of, of developing, multiplying the, the nation of Israel, the seed of Abraham, God was going to send them in through Moses and then under the leadership of Joshua to go and wipe out all the Canaanites in the land of Canaan and uh, the Amorites and all the rest of those that dwelled in that land and to actually kill them and replace them on the land as God's people in the land. And it says, in, in, and this is a prophecy concerning that, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. But in the fourth generation, after, they, after Abraham, the fourth generation, shall they come hither again. They're going to be in the land of Egypt. They're going to come back to the promised land. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now that's interesting to me, that God has a certain amount of sin that he tolerates. And when you hit that level, <laughs> boy, you're in trouble. Because what it is, is they've already turned from God and God cut them off. That's Genesis chapter 10, or chapter 10 and 11. In Genesis chapter 12, God called out Abraham, but he's got to make a nation out of Abraham, and it's going to take him 400 years. And after 400 years, then that nation is going to leave Egypt, and they're going to go to the, the Canaanites, and God is going to pour out his final wrath against the Canaanites by sending Israel in, and the orders are to kill every man, woman, and child. Why? By that time, the iniquity, the sins of the Amorites are going to be full. God's going to have his fill of them. They've already turned away from him, and they're going to keep on sinning. But at that point, he draws the line and judgment falls. Come over with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. God raised up the nation of Israel to be a testimony of him. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans that the name of God is blasphemed because of the nation of Israel. They, rather being a testimony of God, wanted to be just like all the other nations. And God judged them all kinds of times in the Old Testament to wake them up, to make them to be His people. Finally, He gave them a Savior, Jesus Christ, and they rejected Jesus Christ. And, and not only did they reject Jesus Christ, but God cut off the nation of Israel raised up the Apostle Paul and made him the Apostle to Gentiles. And the Jews, they didn't want Jesus Christ, but they didn't want the message of Jesus Christ going to the Gentiles either. And notice what Paul says to the Thess Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians, oh, it's chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because you receive the word of God which ye have heard of us, uh, which ye have heard of us, uh, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. There were some Jews in Judea who believed in Jesus Christ, but they suffered by their own countrymen, the own Jewish people. 
persecuted those who would believe, their own brethren, uh, national brethren, would believe in Jesus Christ. Verse 15 says, Who killed the Lord Jesus Christ and their own prophets and have persecuted us. Paul's one of those Jews they persecuted. And they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak unto the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins all way. Now, always doesn't mean all the time. The very literal meaning of the word, word all way means all the way. And if you're filling something up and you fill it all the way up, what is it? It's full. And Paul says, God cut off the nation of Israel, sent Paul to preach against the Gentiles, and the Jews have even resisted that and have filled up their sins all the way to the top. All the way. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. And God has judged the nation of Israel. That's where we are in the age of grace. In the age of grace, God has turned to us Gentiles through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And just like Gentiles long ago turned from God, God cut them off, and, 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 and wrath fell on them when they, when they sinned to the fullest. So God cut off the nation of Israel, and as they continue to go against what God has done, they fill up their sins and receive the wrath of God to the uttermost. But you know, this is the age of grace in which yet God today, in His grace, is receiving both believing Jew and Gentile and saving us and putting us into the body of Christ. You know, if the Gentiles filled up their sins a long time ago and the Jews filled up their sins a long time ago, then it's time for just utter wrath to be poured out of God, is it not? And yet God reaches down in His grace and gives both of us one more time. Gentiles and Jews, come to me and be saved. Now, I would ask you this, what's going to happen is if in the age of grace we ignore the goodness of God? You read Romans chapter 11, and it says that if you despise the goodness of God, God will cut you off. And when he does, this period of time on this map here is the wrath of God. It's the tribulation period. And, you know, in the, there's going to come a time that men are going to fill up their sins and transgressors are going to come to a full. And God is going to judge one last time, and it's not. there won't be any more grace. We live in the time of grace now that no one deserved. But when this time is over and transgressors have come to a full, then Satan is going to be unleashed in this world. Come over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, Let no man deceive you by any means. Chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. There's two names for that same guy that we're reading in the book of Daniel that's called the little horn. Revelation chapter 12 and 13, he's called the beast. And, and now here the apostle Paul calls him the man of sin, the son of perdition. He gives him two different names, and you'll see why as we go on here. He says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You talk about the abomination that's going to make desolate. The, the sacrifices are going to go on in the temple and this, this little horn is going to come and he's going to make the sacrifices to cease and, and make the, the, the sacrifices desolate. Why? Well, this tells us what he's going to do. He's going to set himself up in the temple and say, I'm God. Quit worshiping the sacrifices. Quit trying to come to, to God through the sacrifices. I am, I am your Messiah. I am God. He's going, to, this, he's going to walk in and claim to be God. Verse 5 says, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's amazing to me that we live in the age of grace. And you know what this time period is called in your Bible? The mystery. It's a time period God never said that he would give an extra extended time for man to be saved before wrath came. This was a mystery period of time. And in this time period, Satan did not quit working, did he? He, be he kept on working. Paul says in verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And just like Satan wants to be worshipped as God, it's not the time to show up in the temple as God. He's working another way. The church age, 
The mystery of God's grace is that God takes Jews who believe in Jesus Christ and make us part of the body of Christ, the church which is his body. And if you want to see where Satan is working today, don't look in a temple, look in a church. Because that's where Satan is operating today. He takes the same thing God is doing and he tries to operate in a counterfeit way to draw people away from the truth. And Satan today is involved in a church. That's the mystery of iniquity. God is working, saving people and placing them in the true church, the body of Christ. And Satan is working in a church and it's called the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, and that's the Holy Spirit who's working in the true believers today, and that is let means to hinder, he is going to hinder until he's taken away. And you'll see an arrow after the age of grace that at the end of the age of grace, God's going to take away his believers from the earth. And if the believers are gone from this earth, who in the world is going to warn people about the deception of Satan and what he's going to do in the future? There won't be anybody. And that's so the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hinders will hinder until he's taken away. And then shall the wicked be revealed. That is that wicked one. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Jesus Christ will come back and destroy him. But he's got some time to work on this earth before he does that. It says, verse 9, Even him whose working is coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. If you're someone here today who loved to be uh, uh, tantalized by someone who can claim to be a healer, someone who can claim to raise dead, someone who claims to do miracles, you're in a lot of trouble. Because if your eyes are on sightful things, things that you can see, you're not walking by faith. And the Antichrist, this, this satanic worker who's going to come along, is going to come along with power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they may all be damned that believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You talk about transgressions coming to a full, doesn't that describe it? That at the age of grace, God's truth is still being proclaimed and men are still rejecting it. There's coming a time where God says, transgressions are full. I'm done with people rejecting my truth. He's going to catch his people away, hold back the resistance of the Antichrist and let him come with all power and deceiving lies and wonders. And it will be a strong delusion that's sent by God. God says, okay, you didn't love the truth, didn't want the truth, have your own way, believe what you want. And he's going to allow Satan to come in with all lies and cause people to think that he's God. And what's going to happen? He's going to come first as the man of sin. He's just a man. And then something's going to take place where all of a sudden he's going to be the son of perdition. That is, the son of damnation. He's going to be Satan himself. At first he's a man. And then in the second half of this time period called the tribulation, he's the son of perdition. And what he is, he's man who's energized by Satan just like Judas was because Judas is called the son of perdition. When Judas betrayed Christ, the Bible says Satan entered into him. And that's why the Bible calls Judas the son of perdition. This man of sin, he's already working against God, but at a certain point, Satan's going to enter into him. And that's right in the midpoint of the tribulation. The whole tribulation period, we've already established from other studies in Daniel, seven years long. Three and a half years into it, Satan's going to energize that man and then all of a sudden everything is going to break loose. He's going to look just like God and people are going to worship him as God and we're not going to take the time. We're already too low on time. But you read Daniel, uh, excuse me, Revelation chapter 12 and you'll see that in the middle of tribulation it tells you the time period. It calls it 42 months. It calls it 1,260 days. That's exactly three and a half years in prophetic time, 360 days in a year that the tribulation period of seven years is broken down that way, right in the middle of that, Satan is cast out of heaven and down to the earth. And before he's cast down, he cast down some of the stars to the ground also, the Bible says. Then, then Michael the archangel fights with Satan and casts Satan out of the heavens. See, he's not in hell. He's cast out of the heaven down to the earth. Revelation chapter 13, when he comes down to earth, he's going to energize this political man, the man of sin. And, and, and what's going to happen, it describes that there's going to be a deadly wound given to this guy. It looks like he's going to die. It's going to have a deadly wound. And all of a sudden he revives. And when he comes back to life after having a deadly wound, it says all the world wondered after the beast. That is, they're mesmerized. They, whoa, 
Who could fight him? This man must be God. He died and he came alive again. He's going to be the Antichrist. And you know why the sacrifices end? He comes in, there's sacrifices going on, and then he enters in and he ends the sacrifice and says that I'm God, you don't need any other sacrifice. Why? Because he died and came alive again on the final sacrifice for sin. And the people who did not want to receive Jesus Christ, who is God's sacrifice for sin, who did not love the truth and have turned down the truth of Jesus Christ, will receive the Antichrist and they'll be fully deceived because they did not believe the truth. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you. You know, that's quite a warning from Scripture. Do you pay attention when we study the Bible? Or do you just believe everything I roll out here? When I say you ought to go and read Revelation chapter 12 and 13, do you know what they say? Or are you just going to follow along what I say? Who's going to deceive you if anybody's going to deceive you? Let no man deceive you. The Bible gives a strong warning that you and I are to be studying our Bible. Not a bunch of sheep following ignorantly. You know, when God created mankind, we are the only creation that God made that he breathed his spirit into man. And we have an intellect that no other creature of God has. You know what that intellect is? Mentality. The ability to reason and to think and to study and to worship God. But it has to be done in spirit and in truth. And you have a mind. You're not to be an animal just led around by another man. You've got the scriptures in your presence and you're supposed to be reading that scripture and you're supposed to realize what God said is coming and realize the deception that this world is going to go through because they didn't love the truth. Do you love the truth? Do you love it enough to study and search for it as it talks about in the book of Proverbs as someone who studies and searches for gold? Well, I'm warning you that you need to do that. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you allow me to be your teacher. But you better be a Berean and search the scripture to see if these things are so because someone is following another man and that man is leading him down a primrose path. He's going to be just like the man of sin and someday the man of sin himself will take the whole world and deceive the whole world by miracles, by signs, by even a resurrection, by the energy of Satan. Satan himself is going to enter into that man and he's going to cause all the world to think he's God and Satan's goal has always been to be worshipped by God's creation. Instead of God, he be worshipped. And it's going to happen. Why? They didn't love the truth. They didn't want it when it was given. They filled up their sins all the way, and God says, go ahead, have your way. And Satan is going to be unleashed. So I warn you, don't let any man deceive you. Be a Bible student. Search the scriptures. Discuss them with me. If you think I'm teaching something in error, let's discuss them together. Let's teach one another, but let's seek the truth by all means. Daniel chapter 8. Go back there, please. Daniel chapter 8. It says in verse 13, Then I heard one of the one saint speaking unto another saint, saying to that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The sanctuary will be cleansed at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Daniel's looking at this vision, and you know in Daniel's day there was no sacrifice going on. He's captive in Babylon. The sacrifices end, the temple was destroyed. All of a sudden he sees a vision. There's sacrifices, there's a temple. And he says, how long concerning the sacrifices uh, and, and the abomination that's going to take place and the trodden underfoot until it's cleansed again? And he asked a question of duration. How long will that all take place? Because it wasn't happening in his day. It was going to take place in a future day. And the Bible tells us how long, does it not? 2,300 days. And what takes place at the end of 2,300 days? The sanctuary is cleansed. You know, there's a lot of argument over what that 2,300 days is. To cut all the arguments down, one of the basic ones is taught by the seven-day Adventists. They said a day equals a year. That that means there's 2,300 days until Jesus Christ is going to return. Therefore, 18, uh, 1844, I think it's March, I've got the date here. Yeah, March 21st, 1883, or March through March uh, 21st, 1844, Jesus Christ is coming back. Well, he didn't make it, did he, folks? <laughs> the sanctuary wasn't built, wasn't cleansed, it didn't happen. 
So they had to revise their teaching because they, they had this all down pat and they, they knew what it was. They revised their teaching and finally they've concluded he's cleansing the heavens. That's what he's doing now in preparing for Judgment Day. And he began to do that in, in, in 1844. Well, that's not what this is talking about at all. Daniel knew what he's talking about. There's going to be a temple. There's going to be sacrifices going on. And Jesus Christ is going to come back and cleanse it at the end. It's very clear what the 2,300 days are. We don't know when to start the days because we live in the age of grace. But we know they end with the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation period. So all we've got to do is back up 2,300 2,300 days into the tribulation period. And here we have just 220 days after the beginning of the tribulation period, Israel is going to start sacrificing again. They're going to sacrifice for 1,040 days. And after 1,040 days, they've hit the middle point, And then the Antichrist stands up to be worshipped as God and ends the sacrifice and they begin, they end the daily sacrifice, and he trods it underfoot for the last 1,260 days. And so we not only know from that prophecy that the temple is going to be rebuilt and sacrifice is going to be going on, we know when they're going to start. Just 220 days into the tribulation period, sacrifices are going to begin again. And then all of the things that we're reading are going to take place. And God revealed it to Daniel long before it ever happened. And it's certain and it's true. And I remind you one last time, it's an abomination to God. If your faith is in anything else than Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead, who is the true Son of God, the only sacrifice for sin, the only way you can be saved, then your faith is an abomination to God. It might be faith, but it's an abomination to God. Jesus Christ is your only hope for eternal life. And God desires you to love the truth enough to realize that he sent his Son, to came into this world and died on Calvary to be your full, complete payment of sin, so that you won't trust man, you won't trust religion, you'll trust him to be the savior God sent him to be. And he's already paid for sin, and God's just delaying wrath, waiting for others to be saved. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your savior, that is, only him to be your savior, and his death, burial, and resurrection as your payment for sin, you're not saved. God gave you the mentality to have a decision, to make a choice. And you can choose right now that Jesus Christ and his death on the cross will be your hope of heaven. And when you make that choice, God immediately saves you. It's a work of God. He saves you, seals you with his Holy Spirit, and promises you everlasting life. And it's yours because God says it's yours. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Shall we pray? If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can do it right now. The heads are bowed and the eyes are closed and you've got a second here. Why don't you whisper a prayer to God? Prayer don't save, but the decision does. And if you've made the decision, why don't you tell God you're making it? Why don't you run it through your mind and acknowledge to God that you're trusting in his payment for sin, the Lord Jesus Christ, who already came, who already died, who already rose again, as revealed in his word to be the payment for your sins. And if you've got the payment of your sins, if your sins are paid for, you have everlasting life. He that hath the Son hath life. Receive Jesus Christ by faith, and you're saved. To the rest of us, let no man deceive you. Dear God, our Father, we thank you today for the time we spent. We thank you for a Bible that real, we realize is the truth that doesn't change. It's always right. Therefore, we can put our faith in your word, which is the Bible, the word of God. And Father, no matter what men say, the pages of this Bible don't change. It still says the same thing. And we can have a sure foundation of truth as we make it the foundation, as we believe what you've said to us through it. Now, Father, we pray that your son has been received by each person that's here and that they will continue then to grow in grace and knowledge and that we might worship you in spirit and truth and indeed be pleasing and honoring in your sight. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.